Uh, so, uh, build men, getting, we're getting kicked back, getting kicked back, uh, we're getting it kicked back off, however we want to say this, uh, but uh, I know, I know um, folks maybe um, have attended for a while, maybe haven't, and so one of the things we, we do here is we typically walk through um, uh, a, a br- abbreviated version of, of sermon, Sunday sermon, not a recap, but, but making particular application to us as men. And we also record it so that um, those uh, who are not able to attend can watch online. And uh, we found that even those who may have uh, been uh, tra- transitioned to other st- cities or other states, uh, particularly by the military, have stayed and connected with us um, and, and, and have shared uh, how, how much of a blessing this has been, especially over, uh, while they're overseas. And so uh, I want to start off tonight by just since we're, we're reorganizing, regathering, coming back um, for, for this build men is, is why we build men. I want to give clarity on why. Many of you know why. It's not, a, you're not, it's not confused as to why we build men, uh, but I want to I focus our attention uh, on, on that, that question. Why, why build men? Um, we want to build men, uh, not beat them up. We want to build them. We want to encourage them. We want to strengthen them. So it's not just uh, training. It is, it is really a, a building or a forging or, a, or an encouragement, uh, a, a building men up. And so we want to build men up in Christ. We want people to uh, uh, know, love, and trust Jesus and, and see Jesus as truly the, the center of their life and build, therefore, their lives around the worship of Jesus. And that, that's the main objective. Um, but moreover, we, we want this to not just... Uh, be about you as individual men, but it to overflow and spill out into all the areas of your life, into your, your relationship, yes, with the Lord, but your relationship with your spouse, if you have one, kids, if you have one, your work environment, those whom you're discipling, other men uh, we want to build up in Christ as well. And so uh, our desire is to equip you. Um, and so the long-term hope is that not only would we come here and have a weekly teaching and equipping, um, but this would, you, you would develop and cultivate relationships that would extend beyond uh, just Sunday or Tuesday night, uh, that it would extend into, into your week, that you would be an encouragement and a blessing, and there'd be continually uh, a building up of one another in the weeks that, that, that follow and in your lives that you live and lead. And so the question, uh, why focus on men, I think should be addressed, is that why do we care so much to focus on men in particular? Why why do we have a men's ministry? Why do we have a women's ministry? What's so unique about that? And why do we call it Build Men? And why is it so focused on the men? Um, n- number one, we have a God-given assignment. Men have a particular God-given assignment uh, to take responsibility first for themselves um, and then for whatever God, domains God, God has given them to oversee and lead out and serve in. Um, uh, so we want to equip you in those domains. We want to equip you as the leaders God has, ca- has called you uh, to, to work out and lead out your God-given assignment. Uh, additionally, we want to encourage you um, in, in, in the ways in which God has uh, p- particularly placed you. Each one of you men has been placed in a, in a, a family or a work environment or a portion of the city that is unique to you. Um, in many of your jobs, you, you may be the only person who knows, loves, and trusts Jesus. And so you may be uh, the only Christian anyone uh, sees. And so we want to equip you to, uh, and we want to encourage, not just equip you, we want to encourage you, because that can be um, pretty draining from time to time. If, if that, uh, you men go out working on, on, on your job, on your craft, whatever God has called you to, in the, the, the mission field God has placed you, um, in a world that doesn't um, appreciate the fact that you know, love, and trust Jesus, you might feel a little discouraged or beat up. And uh, hopefully when you come, when you, we gather together uh, for a build men, it's, an, it's a time for you to be encouraged, nourished, and, 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 and strengthened. So that's another reason why. Uh, we want to focus on you, particularly as a man, um, but particularly as a man in your environment where you, where you live, work, and play, and in the family or the domains God has given you to oversee and love and serve in. Um, and, I, and I've said this before, but I'll say it again. Men... Um, haven't re- men who haven't received the 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 biblical blessing of masculinity. I say it that way uh, for a particular reason because um, I believe masculinity is not toxic. Sin is. 
So we live in a world that, that talks about toxic masculinity, uh, but we're really talking about men who are, are, sinfully, are sinful, and it's sin that's toxic. Masculinity is not. There's no toxic masculinity. There's no toxic femininity. There's, th- those don't actually exist. Uh, it's, it's sin that distorts. And so in our world that we live in today wants to coin terms and make it seem like it's guy's fault for things when the Bible has nothing to say, to, has nothing to, say uh, to, to, to that being the issue. It's not masculinity. It, it, is, it is sin. It's sin in the hearts of men that create toxic environments, that create toxic relationships, that, that create w- uh, the image of what we think of and what the world has deemed as toxic masculinity. So there is a redemptive reason why we are going after men and why we are discussing this in the context of men, because there is a blessing, a God-given blessing that masculinity should um, uh, come to bear on the lives of, of not just you men, but the lives in which uh, uh, that of, of anyone you encounter. Uh, a godly man should be a blessing to the world should be a blessing to their wife, should be a blessing to their children, should be a blessing to their neighbors, to their coworkers. To, it, there should be something about God's men, uh, a true masculinity, and that's what, masculinity is not Christian or not, or sorry, it is not non-Christian and neutral. The word masculinity is 100% Christian. A man who is masculine and is not a Christian is not masculine. He is just a male. The, the, the ultimate form of masculinity is, is the God-man Jesus. He is, and, it, and to, you can identify with maybe the clothes he wore, but that doesn't make you masculine. You could quote the verses he said, that doesn't make you masculine. You could even be male, that doesn't make you uh, uh, masculine in a God-given way. It means that you, you might carry traits that men carry, which is unique to uh, you know, the gender of of male, uh, but that doesn't mean you are a a blessing of masculinity to the culture. We receive that blessing uh, to, uh, of masculinity um, not from within ourselves, but from outside of us. Men who have not received the blessing of masculinity can't give it away. We see this in, in, in you, you may even relate to maybe a, a, a leader or a father or someone in your life, um, and, and if, someone, if, if someone has come alongside of you and, and poured blessing into you, man, you feel pretty good, like it's an encouragement. But many of us have leaders or people that have uh, been in our life that didn't deposit blessing, but rather just made withdrawals. And so there, there is a, a void there that we've been looking for the blessing of masculinity in, in maybe our job, maybe in the car we drive, maybe in the sport we play. We've been looking to be blessed as a man um, in many different ways. When all men need the, the, the blessing of masculinity to come from their heavenly father. And so what we want to do here is we want to, uh, to, to, to focus our attention and receive the blessing from God our father uh, so that we have something to actually t- give away. We can actually be a blessing. Now, I'm not saying that those who uh, are not Christians can't do good and they can't be a great people to be around. There's not stuff we can learn from them or that they can, um, you know, have some, they could be honorable and respectable in various ways. What I'm talking about and what we're talking about throughout Build Men is not just being a morally upright good person in society. That's not what we're after. We're not after being good citizens. We're not after being good Americans. We're not after being just good coworkers. We're after being good, we're after being Christians, we're after being God's men. That's what we're after. So you could be a well-thought-of person in your, your workplace. You can be a well-thought-of person in the place where uh, your, your, your family thinks of you and, and your friends think, man, that's just a good, moral, good, God, good, good guy. He happens to know God, but, you know, he's just a good guy. He's a good American. That's not what we're after. We want to build you men and to build men in particular to be God's men. That sometimes God's men are not the most uh, organizationally um, palatable type of men. God's men are not always the people who society looks upon and thinks, man, good citizen. John the Baptist, the most godly man who ever, who, who Jesus says was the most godly man that ever walked on the face of this earth, other than Jesus Christ himself, 
was a, uh, was a renegade of sorts. He stood up to the government. He actually called out governing leaders on their sin and hypocrisy to the point where it got him beheaded. He was not a, a good fit for society. He, wasn't a good upsta- he wouldn't have been seen as a good upstanding Christian, or, or, or sorry, he wouldn't be a good upstanding um, person of his uh, day and age or um, his for his views or, or for society. He may have been considered toxic or threat, but Jesus Christ says that he was a godly, righteous man. And so our point here is not to, to create renegades or to create cowards. It is to create God's men to be used in God's ways for God's timing in the different spheres he's called you to. Some of you will be more like a prophet. Some of you will be more like a priest who comes alongside and in, 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 in walks next to people like a shepherd in care. And some of you will be like um, a, a, just a ruler uh, in, in some ways of an administrator in your, and you maybe only work with numbers. But it doesn't matter if you interact with people uh, in a, a bold public way or behind the scenes, God has called you men to reflect Jesus in all the spheres in which he's called you to. And so that's what we're aiming at. Additionally, I'll say this. Uh, whenever God wants to bring about change or revival in a, in a nation or uh, in, in a time period, he chooses a man. That's another reason why we're talking particularly to you guys as men. Training men is training nations. And now that, I need to quantify that and qualify that uh, a bit. Uh, Training men is training nations. And so what I mean by that is men usually don't think about their, they oftentimes don't think about their legacy and think about their future. Uh, They don't, we, we typically live our lives uh, not in such a way in which we will have grandkids. Put it that way. We typically live our lives that uh, in the here and now, uh, maybe we're thinking about um, the, the, the homes we'll buy for the, for the next five, ten year plan, but I'm talking about um, seeing yourself, it's the likelihood of, of the men in the room, the likelihood most of you will have grandkids. Most of you will have biological grandkids. Statistically, that's true. In the course of a few years and a few generations, there will be uh, among you, could be among you, a little mini nation. And so to, to, to not think about your legacy would be folly and foolishness. And we've been studying through Genesis. And one thing you've seen throughout our study through Genesis is that when God wanted to, to save a people, what did he do? What was the first thing he did? He went after a man. His name was Abraham. Abraham was not a godly man. He was not a Christian. He did not have a godly home. He, God saved Abraham and chose him and then said, I will work in and through you to bring about a blessing to the world. Additionally, I'm going to give you a family. That family is then going to become a nation. That nation is going to be a blessing to the world. There was a legacy in mind in, in Abraham. He had no kids, and he didn't know how this was going to ha- happen. God miraculously worked through his barren wife, gave her a child. His name was Isaac. Isaac had a child named Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. Jacob is later renamed Israel. We've studied Jacob. We've studied Isaac. We've studied Abraham. And what we see in three generations, in a short period of time, literally Abraham, what God told Abraham, that he would be, he, he had one son uh, from his wife Sarah. He had two sons in all from a different lady. But he had two sons, and from both sons became nations. Esau, the Ishmaelites, Jacob, Israel, that's what happened. From from Abraham's line became two nations, one nation that would worship God, one nation that would rebel against God. So Abraham has a son, Isaac. Isaac has a son, Jacob, who is Israel, who has 12 sons, and from them becomes the nation of Israel. I just want you to think, Abraham, he had two kids. Some of you were like, in order to have a nation, I need to have like 14 kids. No, Abraham had two kids. Abraham had one son of promise, though. It was through that one son, Isaac, that he then had a grandson, Jacob, and through Jacob had the 12 tribes of Israel. God's promise to Abraham resulted not just in Abraham having a biological child to raise the disciple to grow up in God's ways, but then to have grandkids, to have great-grandkids, to ultimately have a nation. I think that if we, I even just look at my own family and just think of, like, you know, family Christmases or, or events that I've gone through or and cousins, aunts, uncles, when you get everyone together, 
starts to become, you start to realize that, that your life has, a, has the ability to affect far more people than we could ever think or imagine. And so one of the things when we're doing is we're training, we're building men, is we're also training nations. Additionally, God uh, uses a man named Joseph, whom we, who's one of the 12 sons of, of Israel, whom we are studying and we're going to talk a little bit more about tonight. But then God, when God wants to move in a mighty way, uh, additionally, he continues to call men throughout the, 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 the Bible. He calls David to lead, be a king, rule over and lead his people. He calls prophets, the prophets of old. I've already mentioned he calls John the Baptist, Jesus. Jesus then picks what? Twelve men. God seems to have one uh, main strategy, and that's get them in. Our strategy is not trying to think creatively uh, or be unique in any other way than uh, the way that God did it. And so, do we, believe, do we love women? Do we love children? Do we believe that women and children are a great uh, blessing? And are they equally, should we see them equally as, as image bearers of God? Absolutely. That's why we have a women's ministry. My wife teaches that. I teach this. We're talking about men. And so, I want us to see that each week when we come together, when we come together for Build Men, I want you to think I'm being trained. Trained to be the, the, the godliest man I could be to be a man like Jesus. And the other men here want to help me do that. They want to build me up. They want to encourage me to do that. They want me to see blind spots and, and, and repent of sin where I need to repent of and, and trust Jesus. And, and, I want to, and I, they want me to experience the blessing of masculinity, not the curse of sin in toxic men. What we want to be is, is, a, is, is used by God to be a blessing to our city. Training men is training nations. Eventually, uh, the men will have an effect on the culture at large. The men will have an effect on the nation. If you want to assess a nation, a movement, a church, of any group of people, you want to assess it, how is it doing? Look at the men. I don't care about their financials. I don't care who's in power. I don't care what's going on on the surface. How, what are the men doing? If the men have gone astray, they're not walking with the Lord, that nation is going to be destroyed. Look at any nation in the history of the world. As the men were obedient and steadfast and their hearts and minds were, were uh, worshiping God, prosperity would eventually follow. But the men who rebelled against God eventually laid upon their whole nation judgment that came from God. Look at, read your Bible and see it. Generation after generation that, that continued to, to follow the foolishness and folly of, of the men their nations ended up in ruin. But then God says over, periodically, frequently, that if his people would turn, they would repent of their sin. They would come back to him. He would restore them. And so masculinity is a force of good to be a blessing in society. We must be the type of men who, who worship our God, who repent of our sin, who, who rejoice and love the things of God revealed through his word. And we need help to, to know those things, grow in those things, and walk in those things. And so we need to know also what masculinity is not and so we need to help one another uh, navigate the, the pressures of a society and a culture that doesn't actually uh, think it's a good thing to build men. The United States of America does not think this is, the, this is the focus that we should have. We should go after the men. We should build the men. We should train the men. We, we do not care about that regard in our country. And we will experience the foolishness and folly that will follow because of that. But God's church is, is different. God's kingdom is different. We live our life not by the standards of the nation we live in, but by the kingdom that which rules over us. We are citizens of this nation, but we are citizens of heaven. And so we take our cues from Jesus in the Bible, and, and it's, our, it's our job to, to fall in line with our big brother Jesus, who is the most masculine man who ever lived, who is the most tender man who ever lived, who is the toughest man who ever lived. He is the perfect man. We take our cues from him. And tonight, what we're doing is we're going to look at a man named Joseph, uh, and we're going to look at his family, and then we're going to look at his calling. 
And so uh, Joseph is, is, is a man whom we, we are studying as a church through Genesis. And Joseph is a man who in the Old Testament is one of only a couple men who actually exemplify uh, the type of godly character that I believe we must have to navigate the world we live in. Uh, Joseph is going to experience a lot of hardship. Joseph is going to have a lot of family drama. Joseph is going to be lied about. Joseph is not in a culture that sees him as, as uh, the, a godly man being a, the way forward. He's actually going to be in a pagan land where they worship false gods and many gods. And God's going to use him mightily. And through Joseph, one faithful man, God is going to use Joseph to be a blessing to the entire nation of Israel. Without Joseph's obedience, without Joseph's character, without Joseph's calling, we may not, have, we may not see this, this beautiful uh, caring, uh, care that God has for his people, his nation of Israel, if men like Joseph were not raised up by God. And I pray that we'd have a, a room full of men who are like Joseph, raised up by God to do mighty things here in the city. And so, man, that's the kind of vision for who we are, what we're doing, why build men, and kind of where we're going throughout the rest of our series and, and our study in Joseph. And so let's talk about his family for a minute. Joseph's family, Genesis 37, in verse 1, it says, uh, J- Jacob, that's his dad, Joseph's dad, lived in the land of his father's sojourning in the land of Canaan. So Joseph has a family. I want us to see this. Joseph has a family. He has a family who, has a, who lives in a particular area. They live in the land of Canaan. That's the land in which his father uh, was sojourning, living in. That's the land that God gave, uh, t- told Abraham to live in, to dwell in. So he has a land. He has a people. He, ha- he has a particular place. And that's where Joseph, he has a family. He's from somewhere. Every one of you are from somewhere. Maybe it's a part of town. Maybe it's a different state. But we're all from somewhere. We have to understand that. Joseph's family, um, and so next we see that in, in this text that Joseph, um, uh, he was 17 years old and was pastured, pastur, pasturing the flocks with his brothers. That's verse three. So Joseph, he's a young man. He's not, he's not an old man. He's, not, uh, he's, he's a young man. He's 17 years old. Just think about this. He's 17 years old. He has a job. He's working out in the field. He has a responsibility to, to care for sheep. He's a part of a family business. He's, a part, of, he's part of a legacy of faith. His, his grandfather was Abraham. His, or his, grand, his, his grand, great-grandfather is Abraham. His uh, grandfather, Isaac, the patriarch. His dad, Jacob. And now Joseph is living in this land. He's, he's, he's the third link in the chain of, uh, of faith. And he ha- he, he's, he's growing up in a culture that worships God. He has a, he's a young man in this environment. Some of you, that was your story. You, have a, you had a godly father. You had a godly grandfather. You grew up in faith. And that's a great blessing. Don't, don't, you, should, you should rejoice in that. You're like Joseph. And so you, God, at a young age, maybe have been using you, and you're, maybe you're still young. The point being here is I don't want us to miss out on the fact that Joseph, being 17 years old, we're going to get into it in a moment, he had a call in his life. He's a young man who God used mightily. God is not afraid to use uh, any man, but uh, he's not afraid of using young men. In the New Testament, we see in Paul telling Timothy, don't let people look down on you because you are young. I know none of you are 17. They're all a little bit older. But this should be a place where even young men, 17-year-olds, we should have a, a, a crop of, of, of young men growing among us because not because you, that's all you hang out with. It's because we should be the type of men who go after young men. We should go pursue them. We should help them. Not many 17-year-olds had a grandfather and a great-grandfather like Joseph did. Not many 17-year-olds had a godly dad. Not many 17-year-olds had a godly grandfather or a godly great-grandfather. And some of you men understand that. And so we should be the type of men who are on the lookout for those men whom God might be calling, uh, those young men that we can begin to invest in and and to cultivate like, like Joseph. Now, Israel... Joseph's dad loved Joseph more than any of his sons. So this is Joseph's family drama. Joseph's dad chose favorites. Joseph's dad chose favorites. He said, hey, he he looked at Joseph of all of his 12 sons and said, I like you more, I love you more than anyone. And then his brothers, because of that, saw their father's love, that loved him more than all of his brothers, and so they hated him. So you have this family drama. You have this family drama. And so even among Christians, even among God's people, there can be drama. So if you feel like you have a lot of drama in your family, take heart. So did Joseph. 
God can use you, God can work in it, God can redeem it, and God will do that. And so with this, I want us to see uh, additionally about Joseph's family. His father, he, uh, he had two wives and two girlfriends. Not really a recipe for, you know, a, a good home life. Um, uh, he, had, he had 12 sons and one daughter, his daughter whom he paid very little attention to. Not the greatest dad. So if you feel like uh, maybe... Some of you are maybe bitter because you know Christians, and, and, they, and maybe your father was a Christian, or someone in your life was a Christian, your grandfather was a Christian, or someone you, you see as a Christian, and they just weren't very um, godly. They weren't very um, encouraging. They just, they just really frustrated you because they weren't um, the godliest of men. I want you to take heart. Some of you, that may be you. You're like, man, I, I, I can't identify with Joseph. I'm not very godly. I'm not very upright. I'm, I'm just kind of, you're somewhere... Um, you know, in the middle, and uh, my dad was really godly, but I'm not, and I just don't know what to do. I just feel left out. I just feel ashamed. I want you to see that God's going to work through Joseph's family. God's going to bring about redemption, and so the same God that's going to work through Joseph to bless him, he's going to bless his family and his father as well. This is the beauty of Jesus, that he dies in the place for all sinners. That's our big brother. No matter what you've done, what you've said, what you've thought, Jesus has saved, or he has, he has made a way for salvation, for forgiveness, redemption, hope, healing, and blessing to follow. So take heart, men. Take heart. That's why we can be a blessing to one another. And so while he, he, we do have to deal with the reality that Joseph's home life and the, Joseph's family life was, was kind of chaotic. It would have been uh, a tabloid article um, in our day and age. And so because of that, I want us to see that Joseph's very human. He's going to navigate family issues. He's going to navigate financial issues. He's going to navigate uh, uh, workplace environments that are not um, acceptable for, for godly living. And he's going to live out his call, particular call. And so Joseph's call in verse thir- chapter 37, verse 9 through 11, we're going to look at his calling. And I want you to see, men, that every single one of you have a call from God. Every single one of you do. You have a call from God. Some of you are very aware of it. Some of you are still discerning it. But wherever God has placed you, he wants you to, to, to possess. Uh, he wants you to be the type of man who takes uh, ownership, that takes responsibility, to exercise dominion and, and, and seek the good and flourishing of the places and spheres he's called you to. Joseph has a particular calling. His calling is revealed to him in a dream. Two dreams, but here's the second one. Then he dreamed another dream. It's the second dream he dreamed when God's speaking to him through his dreams about his call. God told him, uh, or he told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. And when he had told it to his father and his brothers, his, brother, his, his father rebuked him, saying, and said to him, What is this dream that you've dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept this saying in mind. What this is saying is that Joseph had a particular call on his life. He was 17 and God revealed it to him. God revealed it to him. But at this point in time, um, his brothers, because of that, uh, they're jealous of his call. Either they're jealous of him, they're jealous of their relationship, uh, his relationship with his dad. More family drama here. But what God has revealed to Joseph, he doesn't know the meaning of it yet. But what it is, and I'll give you the the end story, is that ultimately uh, this will be fulfilled. God's call on, on, on Joseph's life will be that he reigns and rules in Egypt, a godless land, and, and through his leadership in, in Egypt, he's, allowed to, he, he's able to f- provide uh, literally uh, flourishing and uh, blessing of, of food and crops for his, his family and for the nation of Israel because there was a drought in the land. And that sounds good and great, but the path that he's going to endure in pursuit of his calling is not like one you probably would think. God gives you, so some of you, God has given you a vision, God's given you a call, God's given you, uh, uh, you, you know where God is leading you, and you're like, man, it's not looking like a, it doesn't look like that. See, the way that Joseph rose to power was first through being sold into slavery. Didn't see that one coming, except for those who were here on Sunday. Uh, next, he was he, he rose to prominence among, as a slave uh, with the man who owned him. And then that man gave him charge of his, his property and his house and all of his possessions. And then that man, Potiphar, his wife, 
claimed that Joseph uh, sought to uh, rape her. Now he's being me too his, his reputation is, is ruined. And, 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 and just, I want you, I say it that way because that would have been the context. Think about it. That would have been the context. That would have been, publicly, there wouldn't have been some, uh, we, we get to see that he was innocent, but publicly in his day, he was not viewed as innocent. He was put in prison. He was put in prison. So he was a, sold into slavery, got lied about, uh, about uh, uh, you know, raping a woman, and then thrown in prison. In prison, he rose to prominence there and interpreted dreams of, of some of the men in prison. And one of them said, because you have helped me in discerning what God is, is speaking to me, when I get out of here, I will, I will tell the king and we'll get you out of here. Guess what that guy does? Doesn't tell the king. He's in prison for long. He's in prison for upwards of 20 years. This doesn't look like, this doesn't look like prominence. I want you to see that God has a calling on your life, like Joseph, but it may not be the, the climb the ladder of success that you have envisioned it to be. It may be successful. It may be powerful. You may be used mightily by God, but it may not look like you once thought it would look. And then those looking on and into your life may not look at you and go, man, surely that's the life I want to I wanna lead. Seems like that guy's going through a lot of hard times. He's getting hard pressed. He's getting, I don't know if that's what following Jesus looks like. I don't know that I want to do it. This is why we need one another. This is why we have an environment to encourage one another, to build one another, to, to help us to maintain focus on what God has called us to. See, in, in Joseph's life, what we see is, is God working what we, we, we call the, the pro, his providential hand. That's his unseen hand working behind the scenes. Ultimately, we find out to the end of Joseph's story that all of these things that were evil, God, though they were evil, though other men meant them for evil, God turned them and used them for good. The whole time, the whole time, in, in Joseph's story, the, the whole time we see that Joseph, in, the, in all of the hardships, all of the lying, all of the manipulation, all of the, the deceit, all of the things that happened to him, he never complains, never questions God, he never disobeys. And so Joseph's character is on full display through the many trials, the many things that he must endure as God leads him towards his calling. And so what I want us to be is the type of men who are able to, to navigate the hard things of this world, whether it be due to sin, whether it be due to culture, whether it be due to uh, our own sin or our own upbringing or our family environment or our work environment. Whatever we're going through, Joseph goes through it all, and we're going to see that he continued to be steadfast, to worship God, and his character, his godly character was on full display. Was he perfect? Absolutely not. Will you be perfect? No, but can you be a godly example to the men and women you, 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 you are around, whether it be in your home, in the church, or in your workplace, where you live, work, and play, can you be an example of, of Jesus? Can you, your character be on display? And I'll tell you this, whenever you actually go through hardship, hard times, especially like, like Joseph will have to go through, it's through those moments where his character is, is not just refined, but it's on full display. And so, I'm going to end with this. 1 Timothy 3, verse 1 through 7, speaks to what a man must be. This is what God says a man must be, the character a man must be. Now, some of you know that these are the qualifications of an elder. And you'd be like, well, this is only what elders must be. No, this is what a, an elder must be or he will not be an elder. But elders, elders in the church are to be the type of men whom the rest of the men in the church ought to aspire to be like, ought to want to be like. And so what really elders are, an example to the other men, um, and the qualifications of the elder are, are, are things that all men should aspire to. They should want to be uh, uh, at least the character. You may not, you know, I don't want to be a pastor, don't want to, and that's okay. You should aspire to want to be, have the character of an elder. We all should. That's the reality. That's, the, that's what a man ought to be, a godly man, a masculine man. And so there, we must not go, I don't want to be a pastor, so I don't need to have good character. I don't need to be godly. I don't need to, 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 to 
be the, the type of man that Joseph would be. Joseph's not a pastor, but he has the character of one. And so the first thing in, in verse 1 of, of 1 Timothy chapter 3, it says that uh, he who aspires to the office of an overseer aspires or, or desires a good thing. And I want us to get, think about, not in the context of elder, but just in being a man. Do you aspire to be a man? Do you aspire to be a godly man? To be God's man? To be a man of God? Do you aspire to that? That's where we got to start. Because you got to have a want to before a how to. And many times we give the how to before there's a want to. And so if you want to, if there's a want to, to be a man of God, to be used by God, to have the godly character that God requires of his men, here, here's what he requires. He requires men to be above reproach. That means that we are, we are not men who, uh, who, who find ourselves um, in scandal because of our sin. Additionally, he says God's man must have a, he must live in a particular way with his wife. He says they ought to be a, he, he ought to be a one-woman man. He ought to be the husband of one wife. He ought not have multiple wives or girlfriends or he ought to be dedicated to one woman. So to be a man affects not just our, the way we interact with others, but it affects the way we interact with women, particularly our wife. Additionally, it says that a man must be sober-minded, meaning he's able to make decisions uh, and not be led by his emotions uh, primarily. Not that he doesn't have emotions, but his emotions don't rule him. He's sober-minded in his approach. He doesn't have a fear of man to where he can't make a decision because of what other people might think of him. He, he Additionally, uh, it means that he is sober. He's not addicted to drugs or alcohol or, or pornography. He, he, he's, his mind is, not, is freed from addictions. And therefore, he is self-controlled. He's self-controlled. He has control. Not that he is a pull himself up by his own bootstraps, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, he's able to exhibit and in, in practice self-control. Additionally, he's respectable. He's hospitable. Uh, not, so not only is he respectable, people want to be like him, not be like him necessarily exactly like him, but he is a respectable man. Additionally, he's hospitable, meaning he, this doesn't mean he just hosts well with people come over. This means that, that he, he has a particular way of inviting non-Christians into his life. Fellowship is what Christians do to, with other Christians. That's what we call hanging out. That's a fellowship. But hospitality is when uh, Christians bring non-Christians into their sphere of influence and, and into their life to love, serve, care, to build relationships, to point them to Jesus hospitality is welcoming outsiders. God's men must be not just respectable, self-controlled, sober-minded, but they, all, they must be hospitable as well. They must be able to teach. And some of you will object going, well, that's only for the elder. Yes, an elder must be able to teach, but all men must be able to teach. For if, he, especially if you were married, and if you ever want to be married one day, God has called you to not just, uh, and if you have kids, you're called, men, to teach your wife, to teach your children. If you ever want them one day, then, then you need to surround yourself with other men who can help you learn to teach. Does that mean you have to be the best teacher? No. Does that mean you have to be smarter than your wife? No. Does that mean you have to know more Bible than your wife? Absolutely not. That doesn't mean anything. It means that you must lead out in teaching in your home and in the spheres in which God has placed you in. All men must be able to teach. They must be able to teach God's word. They may, does it, now, I'm not saying they have to preach publicly, but they, they need to be able to be the type of men who can teach and lead their f- wives, their children, and then those whom that they, God has given them to disciple. Man must not be violent, he must be, but rather he must be gentle. Does that mean a man is not aggressive? That's not what, he, what he's saying. Uh, a man who's not violent is, is, goes back to, again, a man who has control, self-control over his temper. He's not, his, his, his anger is, is not leading him to be violent. He doesn't have hatred in his heart towards others. He has gentleness and tenderness towards others. This is what, this is a type of man, a man who is a gentle to his wife. He's gentle and tender to his, his kids, but he's tough for them. He leads out, he loves them, serves them, he protects them. This is how Jesus is towards us. Moreover, a man must not be quarrelsome. He's not getting into stupid Facebook arguments. 
so many men who would just, if they could just learn that one thing, they'd be more used by God than they could ever be if they would just get off the internet. They're not a hero there. They're actually a loser. That's what they are. Quarreling on the internet is for losers, not for God's men. You're like, that's offensive. Mm, maybe. Not a lover of money. He's not a lover of money, meaning that he's not, his desire, he loves God more than anything else. And money, he sees, not that he's, he, he doesn't have money, is that he doesn't love it. He doesn't love it. Love it. He, he uses money wisely. He stewards money wisely. He, money is a tool for ministry. Money is a tool to, for blessing other people. Money is a tool, not an object of worship. That's what it means. He's a good manager of his household, meaning that he, he's, he takes ownership of his household, not just his, the relationship with his wife and kids, but, but how they orient themselves, how they w- conduct worship in the home. How, how they lead their lives. Are they, he, he's aware of what church they're going to, what their kids are learning in their kids' ministry if they have one. He's aware, he's leading, he's overseeing, he's governing, he's managing his household. Does that mean he does everything? No. Does that mean that he, someone else can't do his financials? Uh, he can hire someone, he can do all that. But it's his, it's his responsibility and he's a good manager. Next, he's maturing. Uh, the text says he's not a recent convert. What that means is that uh, it, God's men should be maturing in the process of maturing. Some of you are recent converts. That's awesome. Don't stay there. Mature. A man must mature. And lastly, he's well thought of by outsiders. It's not because he conforms to the way that the outsiders see him, but meaning that when the outsiders think of him, they, they understand. When it comes to his, his, his character, his work ethic, is he an honest man? He's well thought of. He has non-Christian friends. So these are the things a man must be. And I want you to see, as you study through the life of Joseph, you are going to see that this is the type of man Joseph is. And Joseph is not a pastor. So while this text is for, is a must for those pastors, it's also a must for men in their, in their character if they want to be a man of God. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to enter a time of, te- uh, we, we finish our time of teaching, we enter a time of discussion. We have some group questions, and so we're going to get around the tables uh, you can go ahead and you know, go to the table, which you, 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 you normally do if we need to merge tables, we can do that. But I want us to see, men, that, that while some of these words, uh, as, you, as you looked at the, the qualifications uh, of, of what it means to truly be a man in First Timothy, you're going to find areas where you're like, man, I'm knocking it out of the park. There's areas where you feel like God has done something supernatural in you and, you've, and, and he's blessed you in one of these areas. Please see that, 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 that use that as a means to encourage the brothers at your table, not to discourage them, not to beat them up, not to puff yourself up. And if there's an area of your life where you feel like, man, I really need to grow, and I, I need people around me to help me, to support me, to encourage me, be honest. My hope is that when we get together, we would see not that we would not judge one another based off of the sin of our past or, or the folliness of our past, but we'd see ourselves like Jesus sees us as adopted, redeemed brothers who the righteousness of Christ is on. Do we do foolish things? Do we need to repent? Yes, to both. It's our job as brothers to not scold one another, but to encourage one another unto that repentance and to, and to that godliness. And so I know we went a little bit longer, maybe than normal. I want to give you some vision. I wanted to give you some specifics about uh, Joseph, his family, his calling, and his character. And my hope and prayer is that you men would be like Joseph and that we will see, because of Joseph, the nation of not only Israel will be blessed, but Egypt will be. All those ungodly leaders that Joseph will work for, their companies, their corporations, flourish because of him. And I want you to be those type of men. And so it starts with, with you uh, and who you worship and the men you surround yourself with. So I'm glad you're here. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, we love you. I ask you to bless these men. May they enter this time of conversation in a way that um, would, would, would build them up, not beat them up, and would um, you do something that um, they don't even expect. 
um, something that's um, powerful, something that's effective in their life tonight. Lord, would you continue to use us as a church to build men, to bless men, and may we see the fruit of it um, in, in individuals' lives and in families' lives and children's lives, and may we see it through for generations to come. And may the city be radically transformed because these men are like Joseph. And God, if you can use one man how, uh, mightily to, to bless a whole nation, how, how much more could you do with, with a, a, a room full of men and an army full of men uh, who know, love, and, and trust you, Jesus? And so I ask that you just continue to form us into Christ-likeness. Uh, do so with great, with great power tonight. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.